Hello and welcome. Um, there has been a great deal of talk in India recently about two separate issues that seem to be connected to each other. One is the issue of how to patent and exclusively license the results of publicly funded research, uh, which is the subject of a debated and contested legislative draft. And the other is how to use, or if to use at all, genetically modified or GM crops, which is typified currently by the debate over BT Brinjal. In this context, it's a great pleasure to have with us Dr. Richard Jefferson, who's been at the forefront uh, over recent years of both of these issues in a variety of ways. Dr. Jefferson is a molecular biologist by training and has had a long and illustrious his career in um, plant molecular biology, culminating a few years ago, as far as uh, some of us are concerned, in his discovery of and decision to create a model of open source biology um, that may serve as an alternative way of bringing innovations into society. So uh, welcome, it's a pleasure to have you. Thank you, it's a delight to be here. Tell us something about how you came to um, open source biology? Well, I guess you'd say that it wasn't modeled on the software world. It was actually a parallel development. About 25 years ago, uh, I was <clears throat> fairly obsessed by the, the potential of what we call enabling technologies, tools, to change the opportunities that people have to solve problems. And I was very intimately involved in agriculture. And my observations were that the best problem solving was done by those who experienced the problems. It seems a logical statement, but in the world of top-down problem solving, it seemed heretical. So I decided early on that myself and a team would form an idea that later became an institute called Cambia, which in Latin means change. The focus of the institute was to design technologies and provide them with no constraints, which were built to fit the hands of a new set of users, whether they be scientists or agricultural scientists, agricultural practitioners, uh, in any of a variety of settings, including in India, in China, in Pakistan, anywhere within Asia, Africa, Latin America, that previously had been more in the supplicative or recipient mode of agricultural development, <clears throat> to try to encourage them to be far more active in developing their own problem-solving approaches, their own problem-solving paradigms. So we were, in a sense, a targeted social enterprise using science as our, as our palette. So we set out to invent technologies that people could use with without constraints in whatever they think is the right way to do. Uh, what's fascinating about the idea was, of course, that you don't really control it. Once you make it free to people, some people will use it in silly ways, other people will use it in profound ways, and you really can't, you can't control it, but you can't influence it. So our institute was oriented towards designing the tool to fit the operational constraints of users. So if we design a technology to be usable with very little capital threshold, or to be usable specifically under the constraints of tropical agriculture, for instance, it would bias the problem-solving suite, the demographics, really, towards people that hadn't been incorporated into the, into the system before. So we started that about a little over 20 years ago, uh, initially <clears throat> with a relationship with the Food Agriculture Organization of the UN, where I had joined as a molecular biologist and quickly exited 18 months later, recognizing that I was the square peg in the round hole, um, and set it up as a grassroots initiative amongst a few of us, uh, bake sales, car washes, things like that. And then began to explore how we would use these technologies in a sense to, um, not dissimilar to the pioneering work that Aravind Eye Hospital has done, do tiered pricing models by which we could, in a sense, subsidize socially engaging work, which is costs money, uh, but doesn't have a market, with provision at a tiered pricing uh, to those who have the money to use our technology. So, if our technologies could be used by organizations as small as Ma and Pa plant breeding organizations or state departments of agriculture with no budget, or Monsanto or Syngenta, why it's unreasonable about asking Syngenta or Monsanto, under legal terms, to actually de facto subsidize uh, the provision of these tools and the suite of, of capabilities uh, through tiered pricing. And you might be familiar with the incredible work of Aravind Eye Hospital and other social enterprises within India, which have explored very successfully such tiered pricing models. So that's how we started the business of Cambia, uh, and then realized we had to become more and more sophisticated about engaging with very complex intellectual property and capital constraints to actually do something. Um, so we became more and more involved in uh, intellectual property matters. Uh, about 12 years ago, uh, we began uh, 
producing what is now probably the most prominent nonprofit uh, patent search and transparency site in the world that integrates global patents in full text form as a nonprofit, uh, no cost activity, uh, that allows transparency in this very complex, opaque world of IP. Because developing technologies and providing them was something that we knew about. Um, and the challenge with any of us who wish to make a social change is that we must be willing to go into our discomfort zone, not just our comfort zone. And we realized soon that the technologies weren't, that that paradigm wasn't sufficient. It was necessary, but not sufficient. So can you give us examples of the kind of technologies um, that you have dealt with uh, that have been successfully transferred uh, in an open source model? Yeah, sure. Um, the first of them, uh, which was the one that was our, um, you might call it our, our crucible to learn how to, to do this, and we made some mistakes and we learned from those mistakes, was called GUS. I mean, it sounds like a, a garage mechanic somewhere, but it's very prosaically named. It's, it's a reporter gene. Um, when anyone transfers a gene into anything, whether it's a mammalian cell or a rice plant, how do you know it's there? It's an awfully tiny thing. You only know it indirectly. So if you have the ability to monitor when that gene is on, just by a color or a, a, a somewhat a subtle change, that you can actually look as an investigator, as a scientist, or as an observer and say, ah, it's there or how it's performing. It's, my goodness, it's, it's shouting as a gene in that cell, or, or it's quietly whispering in the gene. That's called a reporter gene. And uh, I had invented one called GUS that was extremely widely used in plant biology. In fact, there's been 10 or 20,000 citations in the literature to its use. That was the one we started sending out, and we also filed patents on it. And this was an interesting feature. Back in the 80s, when I developed the technology and in its early implementation, I didn't know anything about patents. To me, it was just something you did when you're an inventor. I, I, I was very naive. Um, <clears throat> I had hair, I had lots of it. Um, and at that time, we didn't appreciate that the patent could be a tool for disclosure and a tool for inclusion instead of its normal mode, which is, of course, a tool to exclude. Uh, so we started to learn these. And as we did this tiered pricing, we also used the patent license as a tool to do that by simply saying, we want you to use it, but there are constraints. If you have low capital threshold, we want you to use it at no money, but you have to behave in a particular way in honoring the ability of others to use it. If you have lots of money, we need you to put something into the kitty. So that was the approach we took in the intellectual property world. And in a sense, we started this movement, I guess, in 1985 or 6. So there's some strange parallels between the open source software development and the biological innovation for open society. Now, it, it's been called biological open source. Uh, but interestingly enough, the original name BIOS we chose because it stood for Biological Innovation for Open Society. So I had our focus on the goal, not the process. But very rapidly, everyone called it biological open source. Not open source biology, which is the study of something, but really innovation, getting something out to people. So we co-evolved, really. I didn't even know the, the software world, and I certainly didn't know I'd be running a, a major IT facility with our patent lens. I never expected that, and I still don't do any coding. But So many of the lessons that the free and open source software world engaged with in terms of how you build communities, how you start social movements, but also how, as it migrated from the uncompromising ideology of, of free software into the more permissive uh, terminology and ecology around open source, which allows the pre-competitive commons to be used in a variety of ways, we actually engaged with a form that looked much more like open source than free software because we had to appreciate that virtually the only engine to produce goods and services in the world is enterprise generally companies. I mean, every book you see here, every fabric that we sit on, everything happens through companies. They're not all big multinationals. Most of them are small, small agencies. But they have their imperatives. They have their exposures. So we had to engage with that. So following on from that, um, there is this argument made that since companies will spend a very substantial amount of work in the product development, that in the absence of an exclusive license, um, the entrepreneurial enterprise will not be interested in taking something actually into the marketplace. Um, how do you think uh, biological open source innovation uh, deals with that? It's a, it's a great question. It goes really to the heart of, um, of what's probably one of the most fiercely contested and evidence-poor areas in social policy right now. First of all, when you have, I don't even dare call it a dialogue, but when you have meetings of proponents and opponents of these, these very severe policy uh, choices, 
they don't end up trying to solve a problem. They end up trying to promote their particular worldview based on a lack of evidence on either side. So you will have businesses that will pound their wingtips on the table and say, we must have exclusive licenses. And actually, siding with those are opportunistic technology transfer associations that say, and, and we have an opportunity to, to actually get some serious revenue from here. On the other side, you might have civil society or thoughtful uh, social policy engagement that says, it's all wrong, you shouldn't do it that way, everything should be free, but they may well not be aware of the very complex natures of risk mitigation that businesses have to encounter. So they pound the Birkenstocks on one side, and we have the wingtips on the other, but there's no evidence base that can guide real problem solving, whether it's for policymakers or for practitioners. Thank you very much for being with us here. We will continue these discussions the next time.